Well, ladies and gentlemen, whenever you are, wherever you are, you are very welcome here. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this uh, webinar. My name is Ian McInnes. I'm based in Glasgow in Scotland, and therefore it's entirely appropriate that I offer you the traditional greeting of this time of year, which is Happy New Year, Happy Hogmanay, and I hope that you have enjoyed at least some time of rest and recuperation in the recent days and weeks. It's an absolute pleasure to, to have you with us and never more important than now for us to be thinking and reflecting on what we're going to do for our patients in 2023. We have in rheumatology such an embarrassment of riches, extraordinary medicines, revised, refreshed strategies, and of course, at the very core of this, brilliant physicians and health professionals together committed to the well-being of the people with the rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. The CSF is very proud, therefore, to bring you this sort of, it's, a, it's like a year in review. Uh, thank you for joining a CSF editorial uh, webinar once again. We were thinking actually about CSF. It's now been in existence for, for eight years. And last year, we had more than 300,000 contacts with health professionals around the world, providing unbiased and independent oversight of the current literature, trying to bring to you the state of the art in a, a digestible format, an interesting format, and in a way that can quickly influence your practice so that that also is state of the art. Now, of course, the way to do that is to bring world-class faculty to the table. And that is indeed what we have done today. It's an absolute pleasure, therefore, to be able to welcome uh, Janet Pope, uh, Philip Mies, and Xenophon Barliakos, uh, respectively covering the globe. We have, uh, we have different sides of, of the, the Atlantic Ocean represented. And of course, we have, by definition, world-class faculty. I'm obliged to offer you one or two housekeeping remarks. Uh, the attendees, um, that's you, are going to be on mute for the duration of the meeting. Um, if you want to ask questions, please do, and please do ask questions. Um, preferably put them in through the Q&A function, which you can find in your screen. You can see on this little um, uh, this cartoon here, which shows you type the question in. And as always, the really difficult questions I'm going to give to the faculty, the ones that are dead easy, I'll be doing my best to answer myself. If you have any problems, technical problems, please use the chat box. And our outstanding technical team who support the CSF webinars will be on hand to solve those problems in a timely manner. Well, this is a summary of what we are going to do, a 2022 summary. That's what this is all about. Um, these, unless you are uh, beginning to wonder where you're at, these are the welcome and introductory remarks. We're going to go to rheumatoid arthritis first, and I'll be delighted to welcome Janet momentarily. Thereafter, we'll be thinking a little bit about psoriatic arthritis. Um, and we have the guru of the field, Philip, in charge then, and, and axial spondyl arthritis Xenophon will be taking us through that. What were the chances of three gurus turning up at the same meeting at the same time? And yet today it's happened. Um, if there are any areas of immediate discussion, we'll take them as we go on. But we are hoping at the end to bring together a sort of faculty discussion. Of course, we'll be prompted and provoked, I hope, by your excellent questions at that point in time. So this is a, a live forum. Live fora are, are fun because individuals interact one with the other and of course especially with you our highly esteemed audience. So without any further ado I'm going to hand the podium across to Professor Janet Pope who is Professor of Medicine in the University of Western Ontario and um, Shuley School of Medicine um, and I'm very Privileged to call Janet a friend, and she's a hugely admired colleague. Janet, over to you. Rheumatoid in a year, quite the challenge. It is a challenge, and thanks, Ian, and thanks for the kind words and the occasional hyperbole with respect to me. It's appreciated. And thanks, the audience, for taking time out to learn more. So I will be talking about bedside with a bit of bench, and you really can't do a review in RA without talking somewhat about oral surveillance. So in brief, as you remember about the oral surveillance mandated by FDA, looking at tofacidinib, the approved dose, five milligrams twice a day, the dose of 10 milligrams twice a day, or a TNF, and depending on the, uh, where you were in the world, either a TAN or septor adalimumab. Methotrexate and adequate responders over the age of 50, and one or more true cardiovascular risk factors. 
And as you remember, it was an event-driven study, and there were two co-primary endpoints. So the first was looking at major um, arterial uh, cardiovascular events, or MACE, and the other was looking at new-onset malignancy. If you had a past malignancy, you couldn't be in. And the outcomes were looked at the two tofacitinib groups together as primary outcome compared to the uh, TNF group. The first thing, as we are all aware, is that it took more than a year and a half to separate the curves that eventually found at about a median of four years of follow-up that the MACE event rate was 3.4 per 100 patient years on the tofacitinib doses combined, and it was lower 2.5 per 100 patient years. So it was a 1.3 hazard ratio. And you would say, okay, both rates are kind of low. There is an imbalance, but the imbalance did not meet the confidence interval that it was supposed to be. It could have been a bit higher, but it didn't meet the confidence interval. So it was an actually overall failed trial where it was not uh, within the boundaries. In addition, which I think surprises me, we'll probably talk about it in discussion, there was also more malignancies. So again, over about a median of four years, cancer rates low in both groups, but absolutely higher, 1.48 statistically more in the tofacitinib groups combined compared to the TNF inhibitors, and there was no dose response. Although some of the 10 BID Zelgans patients had gone down to five milligrams twice a day when the 10 milligram arm was stopped due to an imbalance of VTE, particularly PEs, and also more serious infections, but still no dose response, which I think is interesting. So they are the results in the best way that I think I could explain it to, to understand where we're at there. When we go on to other studies, this is more a little bit uh, mechanistic because this is a brand new kid on the block. I apologize if I say it wrong, but it's Dazodalipep. I think I'm saying it wrong, but it's a CD40 ligand. Those of you who know CTLA4IG, i.e. abatacep, that's a CD40. It's um, uh, stopping the discussion or attenuating it between B and T cells. So in this novel uh, biological drug, it was only 78 patients and there were four doses. So it was um, a combined look at various doses of this CD40 ligand inhibitor versus placebo. And it's easy to see that placebo only goes down a little bit for change of DOS, you can see there, whereas the rest will go down more deeply. There might or might not be a dose response, it's too early to tell. There were some serious adverse events in the um, active group, but not in the placebo. And I would think this is something that will indeed go forward. The change in DOS you think is clinically relevant over 1.2, and it was indeed only a one lowering on placebo and a 1.8 to 1.9 lowering on active treatment. So it's something to watch for over time, and then I'll have to learn how to speak about it, uh, say the name properly. Then you're all aware, I think, of this um, oral um, uh, study of upadacidinib versus adalimumab. To remind you, these were bio-naive patients RA active and randomized to multiple years of either upadacidinib or adalimumab. And then over time, if you didn't meet uh, an endpoint or worsened, you could actually be transferred to the other group. So this study is still ongoing in the main presentations on um on the oral, or sorry, the oral select compare study is really been presented that upadacidinib was superior in two ways compared to adalimumab and your overall change and high bar outcomes and in the proportion still on drug over time. So what is this looking at? This was looking at um, various features. So looking at um, the UPA, 15 milligrams, the approved dose, or adalimumab 40 milligrams sub-Q every other week added to methotrexate and looking at pain. And I think it's easy to see that all in all groups, baseline pain um, in panel A goes down, but you can see it goes down more in the green. And unless if you're colorblind, that's the last bar, it goes down more in upadacidinib. Um, mean pain, change in pain, and different ways of looking at it. 
all the groups do better over time on pain, but uh, a deeper response on upadacitinib. And that's something that we've come to know about the um, JAK kinase inhibitors in general. The next one is another JAK inhibitor, but this is now more a mechanistic study. So it's a mouse study, but I think it's important because the question here is, why is pain improving beyond inflammation in patients on a JAK inhibitor? So in this most model, so this is a model of uh, collagen-induced inflammatory arthritis. So it's a mimic of inflammatory arthritis. It's not per se RA, but it can be used as can other animal models as an RA kind of um, uh, getting insights in, uh, for humans on this most model. So the two important things are there's a vehicle and a control, and then there's baricidinib and there's celecoxib because we know an active control on an NSAID should help inflammatory, but also non-inflammatory pain. So what they're looking at here is I think it's clear to say the biggest delta is in the baricidinib, which is the red, then the celecox of the blue, and then your vehicle um, doesn't have um, as wide a change. And what the idea here is above and beyond the inflammation going on, there's a deeper response to pain. And so we've thought for a while, is there a central mechanism? Is it in the um, dorsal ganglia, et cetera? And I don't think I still know for sure the mechanism, but this is saying at the dorsal root ganglion, because they did dissect out and look, that they saw a more significant change in the patients on baricidinib. Something to think about that there is a connect of treating inflammation helps reduce pain, but there's a disconnect that when you treat inflammation, you might also help some of the residual pain even more potentially in many JAK studies. This is looking at a mechanism. Um, I think I actually might be on time, shockingly. So I think I'll hand it back over to Ian. Yeah, thank you, uh, Janet. Um, I, I, I'm not shocked at all. It's an exemplary uh, and very informative and I have to say, utterly fascinating selection. I, I, we do have a, a communal discussion period at the end, but I, 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 if there are any immediate points, I'm looking at the question and answer, and I don't see any requests for immediate clarifications there. There are one or two very interesting questions coming through. And what I suggest we maybe do is we'll, we'll kind of press on, we'll cover the year review, because there's going to be overlapping issues here. There's going to be issues around pain. We're going to come back to this. And I am quite interested in new MOAs because we're going to hear about that momentarily in, in psoriatic arthritis when we, we look at different kinases, for example. So what I'm going to suggest we do is that we thank you, Janet, and that we now invite uh, Professor Philip Mees um, to, the, to the podium. Um, as is the case, in fact, with all of our faculty, Philip, um, needs no introduction, but that will not stop me giving him one because it's important to celebrate celebrity. And um, Philip is, I think, the, the doyen of clinical uh, trialing and understanding of, of psoriatic arthritis. He's um, professor, director of rheumatology research in the University of Washington School of Medicine, Seattle Swedish Medical Center. Um, Philip, it's always a pleasure to listen to your thoughts and reflections on the area, particularly in psoriatic arthritis, although I give you pre-warning during the Q&A discussion section, we're going to talk about pain, and we're going to talk about mechanisms of pain. So that's just to get your um, your neurons uh, appropriately uh, switched on for, for the discussion session also. But it's been a pretty good year in psoriatic arthritis, and I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Ian, for that kind introduction, and uh, let's press on. So indeed, uh, this first uh, abstract uh, is uh, one that is focused on pain. And it, just to give you a little bit of background uh, for the, uh, in terms of the development of this particular uh, research project, I've been involved in various uh, analyses of pain response uh, with various uh, treatment mechanisms in psoriatic arthritis. Uh, and they uh, actually mirror what Jan Janet uh, just went through uh, with the uh, mouse model in terms of baricitinib. So what we're, we're, uh, we're uncovering is the fact that many of our medicines may 
instead of just simply reducing pain by reducing overall inflammation of the disease, CRP, joint swelling, et cetera, that there might be a direct central nervous system effect of the drugs. And, and we're trying to uncover that. This first really came out with the uh, clinical data on baricitinib in rheumatoid arthritis. And then uh, with uh, tofacitinib, we demonstrated similar uh, findings. And that is that the majority of the pain reduction occurred very early and quickly and uh, was uh, predominantly due to a direct effect of, or analgesic effect, if you will, as opposed to simply uh, working through inflammation, which takes a little bit longer and would be associated with uh, reduction in swollen joint count, for example. Uh, we've also demonstrated this with the IL-17s, but we hadn't yet looked at this with uh, the IL-23 inhibitors. So this was a post hoc analysis of the DISCOVER 1 and 2 phase 3 trials with guzelcomab, an IL-23 P19 inhibitor, uh, and psoriatic arthritis patients. And uh, the graph on the right shows us very clearly uh, that there is a uh, rapid and significant reduction in pain with the two different doses of guzelcomab that were used monthly or every other month uh, versus placebo. And one other finding, uh, they we did a 30% improvement of pain and 50% improvement of pain an analysis. And what the chronic pain literature teaches us is that a 30% improvement is something that patients can palpably detect and appreciate. And a 50% improvement is considered a major decrease in pain. Okay, so that's all clear. What was further then done was a uh, uh, this so-called mediation analysis or path analysis, where you try to understand how is this happening? Is it happening through inflammation or is it through other means? And what was found here was that uh, only about 10% of the reduction of pain was due to reduction in swollen joint count and CRP. And nearly 90% was due to other factors, including potentially direct effect of the IL-23 inhibition on, uh, on pain uh, uh, processing in the central nervous system. During the discussion, Ian, I encourage you to bring out between both, both Janet and I talk, uh, trying to understand, is this due to a reduction in peripheral pain mechanisms, peripheral sensitization? Is it at the dorsal horn? Or is there some central phenomenon going on? Uh, we know that big antibodies don't theoretically cross the blood-brain barrier, but who, who knows? Let's bring that out in the discussion. Moving on, uh, we are all interested in whether or not there are certain biomarkers that can teach us about who or who might respond best to a treatment or what particular clinical domains of a disease such as psoriatic arthritis will respond. And here is a study. Uh, the lead author was Oliver Fitzgerald uh, with the TIC2 inhibitor Ducravacitinib. Highly interesting medicine. It's uh, considered a member of the of the JAK family because uh, it is uh, TIC2 uh, along with JAK1, 2, and 3 are the members of that particular family. Uh, but it has some distinct differences. And we're going to learn more about that in, in, in the next abstract as well when we look at safety. But here we're looking at, uh, so TIC2 inhibition is particularly important uh, for uh, inhibition uh, of interferon alpha, as well as IL-12 and IL-23. And it's the IL-23 mechanism that turns out to be very important uh, in uh, improvement of skin psoriasis. So in, in the, this particular phase two psoriatic arthritis trial, we saw very high levels of skin improvement, uh, not, not unsurprising, uh, as well as uh, the musculoskeletal improvements. So here we're looking at what predicts uh, those responses. So it turns out uh, that the highest skin response uh, was present in patients who had higher baseline levels of IL-17A uh, in their uh, serum, and uh, that higher levels of other IL-23 biomarkers, including IL-19 and something called BD2, 
uh, led uh, were, were predictive of improved ACR20 responses. So here we have some serum biomarkers that are helpful in determining who's going to have the best skin and joint response. Here is an uh, a, a overview article, uh, our abstract, looking uh, at safety, particularly laboratory parameters uh, with the same medication, Ducravacitinib. Lead author is Roy Fleischman. Uh, so what we're looking at here uh, is any changes in blood counts, uh, uh, for example, lymphocyte counts, neutrophils, platelets, and so on, anemia, as well as any alteration in LFTs or cholesterol. These are the big laboratory items that we monitor in patients that are on JAK inhibitors because we know that there can be a reduction of lymphocytes, so neutrophils or anemia, or an elevation of cholesterol or LFTs. However, we know that TIC2 inhibition, and this is a very specific uh, inhibitor of TIC2, there is not really uh, a uh, impact in some of the pathways, especially hematopoietic uh, cell pathways. And so it, it's predictable that there might be a less a laboratory impact uh, of uh, this medication. And indeed, that's the case. If you look in this particular table, you see lots of zeros associated with any grade three or four change um, in blood counts or uh, LFTs or cholesterol change or very, very low levels. What was some of the consequence? Well, we learned from the psoriasis trials with this medication, which were successful and led to recent approval of this drug for the treatment of psoriasis. The FDA dermatology panel decided not to give this drug a black box warning, unlike other JAK inhibitors. So you don't have to uh, use this uh, after a TNF inhibitor, for example. Uh, the oral surveillance trial that Janet referred to is mentioned in the product safety label, but only in the context that it of what particular RA over 50 high risk CV population was in that study. And there is the only required laboratory is in patients who have high risk for liver disease, in which case serial uh, uh, LFT monitoring is recommended, but otherwise no laboratory monitoring is necessary. Now, one of the uh, uh, issues that we have is what about various contextual factors like weight, sex, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, ha might have on the effectiveness of the drugs that we're treating the, with. And uh, for example, if we know that we have a patient that's quite overweight, is a drug at the dosages that are recommended to be treating the patient with, are they in, uh, going to be sufficient for that larger patient? And we've been seeing more and more data coming forth that suggests that female patients may have uh, not as good response to a treatment uh, as male patients. Uh, so this uh, uh, explores that particular issue. Uh, this is data from what is known as the Serena uh, study. This is a um, observational study being uh, done in Europe uh, in patients with psoriatic arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis. And we have uh, in this study over 400 patients with each disease that are being analyzed. And what was shown was that uh, there was greater persistence on the drug secukinumab in male patients compared to female patients. Uh, in uh, psoriatic arthritis, uh, it was 65% uh, 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 were uh, 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 persisting on the drug uh, over a, lo a long period of time uh, versus a lower percentage, 62% in females. And in ankylosing spondylitis, there was also a bit of a difference. Uh, the uh, Most of this discontinuation uh, in the greater number in female patients was due to lack of efficacy. There was also a bit of effect of side effects with a little bit more in the female population. Why might this occur? And we've, we've seen this now in, in other studies. We're gonna look at it in the next uh, abstract uh, 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 related to ixekizumab. 
And another um, abstract at this uh, most recent ACR meeting uh, looked at upadacitinib and adalimumab, uh, where there too, it was noted that fewer female patients had higher response levels uh, than male patients uh, in the select uh, PSA1 uh, trial with upadacitin uh, and, uh, and uh, adalimumab. So one speculation is that there's a certain degree of fibromyalginous in females that may not be as present in males. And what I mean by that is a little bit more central sensitization, a little bit more sensitivity to pain, uh, and that that's being reflected in the composite measures that have some subjective item as part of them. Patient pain, patient global, for example, tend to be higher both at baseline and tracking uh, over time as you treat a patient uh, in female patients than in male patients. This is important to take into account um, uh, because as we're interviewing our patients and asking, how are you doing? And they, and a female patient may say, well, I'm not doing very well. Think about the possibility that they're bio they may be biologically doing well, but they're, uh, they're, uh, uh, some of the subjective components of their disease expression uh, may not be doing as well. There could be other factors as well besides fibromyalgia, including immunobiological differences between males and females, neurohormonal differences between males and females. I'd be happy to explore this more with, with you, uh, Ian, during our discussion session. And then lastly, uh, this is a data uh, from uh, the Ixikizumab uh, psoriatic arthritis trials, SPIRIT-1, and SPIRIT P2, uh, the former uh, being a bio-naive population and the latter a bi bio-experienced population. And we're showing the same thing here, uh, where uh, the female patients had a slightly lesser degree of response in terms of ACR responses and achievement of uh, DAPs to low disease activity or DAPs to remission uh, than male patients. And again, this is due to the uh, com composite measures that have a bit of subjective element in them. So an important contextual factor that we need to take into account when judging uh, treatment in our patients. Thank you so much, um, Philip. As ever, uh, a very clear description of actually quite a, a complex literature. Um, we're going to come back to several themes, and thank you for signposting them so clearly in our um, in our uh, in the course of your discussion. And I, can I just before we bring Xenophon into the fray, can I remind you please to stick questions through the Q and A section? Some of them we're very quickly answering; others I'm going to bring back into the discussion. So uh, I um, I, I'd really love to, to, to get as many questions as we can. And as promised, I'm going to pass all the really difficult questions on to Philip, uh, to Xenophon and, and Janet. So keep them coming as far as I'm concerned. But look, um, this is just fabulous. You will, by the way, see some common themes coming through. We are going to be talking about gender effects. We are going to talk about sex effects. And we're going to talk about um, pain. We're going to talk about common MOAs that are coming through. And also, I'm very interested in the discrete MOAs across the different diseases. They, for me, are always more informative. So with that, and without further ado, it's an absolute pleasure now to ask Xenophon to take over. And Xenophon is going to review the year in axial spondyloarthritis. Um, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ian. I uh, hope you can hear me. I just had the message here that I might have been on mute, but I see that this is not the case anymore. Well, um, I have to admit that I had to say to face the same issue as the other two speakers today, um, and this is that it's almost impossible to put one disease into a 15-minute presentation, especially when it comes to the most important things in spondyloarthritis, and we are Happy that finally also axial disease gets more attention in terms of more opportunities to study the drugs that we have or even getting more drugs into the um, armamentarium. And um, that is something that I will address, especially in my very last presentation, my very last slide. Um, and I have to say that already now I feel um, extremely uh, uh, uncomfortable because I have I had to leave out a lot of things that I would have liked to to, to show today. 
Well, when it comes to um, um, things that we may have known or may have assumed, but now we seem to know better, one of these um, issues is treatment response. And I just was I was just looking into the chat, um, and there has been indeed um, a question on that same topic that I'm presenting you here in the very first um, um, uh, abstract or paper that I'm um, I'm commenting on. This has to do with different um, um, approaches into treatment and different treatment responses um, between males and females. Well, I'm in all of these slides that I will be showing you, I will not so much uh, concentrate on the compound, but more or less on the mode of action. And here we speak about something that we know lesser than what we have known about TNF blockers, and this is IL-17 inhibition. It is already pretty much established in ankylosing spondylitis or axial spondyloarthritis. However, um, this establishment is not just about, this is not about the, the established drugs and the, their effect, but also, as I mentioned before, the subgroups that we are facing off, uh, at. So here it is, the information about males and females. And um, what you um, see in, in the upper part of the right side of the results as compared to the lower part of the results are um, the two different stages of spondyloarthritis. In the upper part, the later stage, the ankylosing spondylitis or radiographic AXPA part. In the lower uh, panel of the key results of that figure, it is um, the non-radiographic axial spondyloarthritis. And there is also a reason to do that, to separate those two stages. I will say something to that later on. So this whole study is the study with exegizumab with the L17A inhibitor. We know it works in axial spondyloarthritis. We know that it works also, at least numerically, it has shown a bit better results in the first 16 weeks against adalimumab. And this is was this was here about uh, about to, to see what happens after one year of treatment in those patients who were primarily treated with the compound as compared to those who may have switched from placebo to the compound. So this means they were treated a little bit later. Later, they had about four months of within a year um, for for treatment responses. And again, in the upper part, later patients in the lower part, younger or earlier patients, and then. What uh, has also been done in those four graphs is the males versus females comparison. Now, what has come out is that um, in both of those subgroups of spondyloarthritis, the R and the NR AXPA, it, we found the same result. And this was that males had better results, better outcomes, better treatment responses, according to us as 40. This means 40% improvement of four domains of the disease after a year as compared to females. And the other very interesting thing was also that although males um, reached their peak um, of the treatment response already after 16 weeks, which was the time point that with this was measured, females needed longer to go to come that far to that end stage of what would have happened after a year. So altogether, by the way, um, what has also was also remarkable was that females um, had started with a higher disease burden. This means higher disease activity as compared to males. So we keep from that trial that indeed males and females obviously seem to be judging their disease activity differently. Is it what Philip also said before? Is it a, a different um, a central way of processing pain? Is it disease activity that might have been influenced by other reasons than just pain? We do not know that yet, but it is very clear that males and females seem to, to obviously report pain differently, but also respond to pain, um, to pain differently. Um, one other thing that um, was uh, pretty interesting to, um, to see, hold on, I just need to go back one slide because I think I, yeah, I, I must have skipped something here. This was my uh, computer not playing uh, well with me. Okay, one other thing that um, seemed to be pretty interesting was um, the information about uh, the same compound. Uh, this means uh, the same way of treatment, which is again L17 inhibition. And those patients who may have the better treatment response possibility or probabilities. These are especially in the non radiographic access spondyloarthritis patients, but this has also been um, shown in radiographic patients. These are the patients who have. MRI positivity, they have bone marrow edema, and they are also CRP positive. And now I say this especially because I made the comment before, radiographic access spondyloarthritis and non-radiographic access spondyloarthritis, 
may indeed also be predictive of how well the patients will respond later on because the radiographic patients seem also to have higher CRP values and also more bone marrow edema overall. So now putting all this in, a, in, a, in one story, um, what was shown in this study here that I'm presenting you was that um, patients with uh, responded well to the L17 inhibition independent of whether CRP was high or low, and also independent on whether or not MRI was strongly positive or not positive, or positive or not positive at all. What you see in the key results in the upper part, and I'm not so much referring on the text overall, as you've mentioned, as you've seen, is that um, uh, I'm just showing you the, the data of the um, uh, MRI negative and CRP negative patients, showing that already 40 or 48, almost 50% of patients have been um, good responders to the drug, but also those who have been um, positive for both uh, objective inflammatory markers have shown similar results. By the way, that's interesting because these data we haven't seen with TNF blockers. We have uh, very clear data there in that area that um, CRP positive and MRI positive, as I mentioned before, are the better responders. This does not seem to be the case with l inhibition. For whatever reason that uh, that now might be, we do not know yet the reasons. Obviously, we learned as we go by the uh, production of data. Now, going on to the next um, uh, trial, I would like to uh, to, to show. Um, this is the trial with a JAK inhibitor, filgotinib, which is not yet approved for the treatment of axial spondyloarthritis, but the study is ongoing. Um, in that study, what we did was to uh, assess the effect of um, the treatment on chronic structural lesions um, of the um, of the sacroiliac joints uh, based on the MRI evaluation. Why is that important? It is important because we do know that I would call it now, generally speaking, any kind of compound you may have seen that is working properly clinically on uh, is also working properly on the MRI inflammation and bone marrow edema. But we do not know yet what happens to the structural lesions. We do know that the NF blockers do block um, uh, structural progression. The same, by the way, is true. And this was shown also in one of the studies that I'm not commenting on here that, was, that came out at ACR this year. Um, this is the same um, with L17 inhibitors, but we don't have so many data, or actually almost no data on JAK inhibitors. So this comment here, the JAK1 um, uh, inhibitor, Filgotinib, um, we took data from uh, the study that um, uh, was a phase two trial. And uh, what we did was to see what happens or what changes in the structural lesions of these patients within a short period of time. This again means 12 weeks. Now, what you see is the bars going up and down again in the key results. I leave it to you who may want to read a little bit more for the for the um, for the text. But I already mentioned what uh, was done in that study. The dark gray, uh, the dark green, is the um, patients who were treated with um, the active drug with regotinib, and the light green are the ones in placebo. And as you can see, there is almost in all. Um, outcomes that we measured a completely different um, way of um, uh, of development of structural lesions. Um, this means for filgotinib, we had lesser erosions already in the, after 12 weeks in the, in the sacroiliac joints, a little bit more of um, fat metaplasia in the joint space, what people call backfill. Same, by the way, was also for the overall fat metaplasia and for ankylosis. Now, what does that mean? Because I, I'm pretty sure that this might be a little bit abstract for some people who may not be so much familiar with MRIs. This very simply means that we are also changing, and already this happens after 12 weeks, we're already changing the, structures, the structural damage that these patients have suffered from in that more advanced disease stage, which is radiographic axial spondyloarthritis. One could also say that maybe we're even inducing new bone formations since there's lesser erosions in the actively treated patients. To my belief, this is not really happening. What I believe is rather happening is that we are filling out the, the already damaged area, but um, it, it remains to be shown. My experience from other trials is that the newborn will not exceed the, the, the so-called natural edges and um, it will not cause ankylosis, um, the treatment that we're giving. This of course remains to be seen, but this is an extremely interesting observation that was done in this uh, trial. And I believe that's something that people should be aware of simply because again, also your reports from the data, from the, um, from the radiologist may report more structural um, um, uh, substance there, more bone or more fat 
Uh, but again, this doesn't necessarily have to be a um, um, negative outcome. Um, another trial, and uh, here we again uh, concentrate on JAK inhibition, has been um, um, shown in that publication, um, which uh, um, in fact did a, took a different approach based on where we analyzed here the, um, the inflammatory damage and the inflammatory signal. Again, as a reminder, all of these patients that we are talking about, they do have axial involvement. This very much means not only sacroiliac joints, but also the uh, spinal structures that are being um, involved and are being um, um, uh, affected by inflammation. And um, so far, we've been always concentrating on the vertebral bodies, the, the middle part of the, uh, of the spine or the more anterior part of the spine when it is obvious that we will have inflammation. So what we did here was to uh, analyze now with a newer score, a different scoring system, also the more posterior parts of, um, of, the, of the spine. And uh, what we found was, and you again see that in the probability plot in the um, right um, um, uh, bottom part of the, uh, of the slide, is that the green patients, which are the actively treated patients, showed more improvement of that inflammatory activity. This is on the left side of that probability plot. The, 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 those dots go down further than the gray ones, and the gray ones were the placebo patients. Now, why, again, is that important for daily practice? Very simply said, because we do know very well that pain and also um, the um, situation of uh, the pain and also the... Um, 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 uh, uh, mobility restriction and functional impairment or even in patients who are active, this may not always come from the anterior part of the spine where inflammation has been shown or has been seen in the last um, uh, studies that we've seen, but it may also result very much from the inflammatory activity of the more posterior parts, which is the facet joints, the crossover tribal joints, and even the spinous processes. So altogether, what was shown here is that indeed, the correct treatment, independent of what treatment that would be, now it is a JAK inhibitor, the correct treatment also leads to inflammatory inhibition or inhibition of inflammation, the decrease of inflammation in the structures that are really relevant for pain and also for mobility. And the last slide and the last uh, study that I would like to show is um, I, to me a very important uh, study that was uh, published uh, at the end of, of the, this year, this means last year in 2022, which is the update of the ASAS-EULA recommendations for the management of axial spondyloarthritis. Now you may be aware already of how we do treat axial spondyloarthritis. Not many things have changed in the uh, in the order of um, application of treatment. This means we start with general education, we start with physiotherapy, <clears throat> excuse me, we start with non-steroidals and thereafter we escalate. And now it comes, the two extremely important changes that we have are that first of all, or the, for the very first time, we do not only refer to TNF blockers as the drug or the, the, uh, the drug class to uh, start with um, when you escalate the treatment, but we also have put IL-17 inhibitors and JAK inhibitors on the same level, obviously saying or stating clearly that for JAK, for uh, IL-17 inhibitors and TNF blockers, we do have a much longer experience with also safety uh, results that are much more robust as compared to the JAK inhibitors. And we also say that um, recurrent uveitis or active IBD should be preferably treated with a monoclonal antibody against DNF. Those patients with a concurrent psoriasis should be treated with IL-17 inhibitors. And the other thing, which is extremely important to me, and that's also clinically re very relevant, I believe, is that we do not say that if one drug fails, the second one should be given immediately, but rather that in exactly that situation where the correct diagnosis has been done, and obviously the proper treatment with a biologic or a JAK inhibitor has been applied, and patients have not um, replied the way we would like them to reply, this means uh, successful treatment, there we do recommend urgently to rethink about A, the diagnosis, or reevaluate of any other reasons of why the patient may not show the expected result and the, sex, the expected response before going to the second biologic or to the next, uh, let's say, circular cycle of, uh, of active treatment. That might even include that that drug 
was not the proper one. This means indeed a primary failure. Might even include also that um, maybe obesity or concomitant fibromyalgia or any other things that we have already discussed in this round may play a role regarding lesser effects or no effect. And with this, Ian, I'm ready. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Fantastic, Xenophon. Thank you. And indeed to all of my uh, fellow conspirators in this review of 2022, thank you for such clear presentations. And thank you also for leaving us a good chunk of time for discussion and, and commentary. So can I um, remind all of you that uh, there's a Q&A section. Um, I'm mildly concerned that we've lost Dr. Pope, but I'm sure our technical wizards in the background are working furiously to reconnect with Canada. Right. So in the meantime, uh, let's, maybe, let's maybe take a couple of uh, questions which have come in uh, from our audience. And maybe, uh, Philip, I, I'd like to come to you first. This is, I, I think, a relatively quick one, actually. But um, the question is, for TIC2 in inhibitors, uh, combination with methotrexate, of course, noting that for psoriatic arthritis, this is not yet a licensed approved medication. But Philip, any comments on liver function, TIC2 inhibitors, Decruva specifically, uh, with or without methotrexate? Thanks. So a, a, a fact that I neglected to mention when I was presenting the laboratory safety data with Ducra was that uh, roughly 54% of the patients were on background methotrexate in that particular study, yet didn't have uh, grade three or four bumps in liver function test. So uh, it looks as though uh, the if Ducra can be taken safely with, with methotrexate. I must admit that in my practice, if a patient is getting onto a drug like Ducra that's very effective, we generally winnow away uh, methotrexate on, on that patient. We'll typically take them off of it. And the patients prefer that because A, it's a simpler drug regimen. Uh, they uh, don't like the subtle side effects of nausea and so and fatigue with methotrexate. They don't like the alcohol restriction. People in Seattle really like to have their, their nightly glass of very good wine that we have here. A little bit better, I think, than the wine that we have in Scotland. And so the uh, uh, these are all reasons why generally we don't we use a, an agent such as a JAK inhibitor as monotherapy, uh, but it it can be safely taken together. No, th th thanks, Philip. I have no comment to make in Scottish wine. Believe it or not, such things do exist. But um, personally, I would use them to run my tractor rather than uh, <laughs> enhance the quality of my discussion in the evening. Um, uh, Janet, warm welcome back. Um, Sorry so about that. <laughs> no apology and needed at all. Uh, just so you understand, there are lots of PhD students outside Janet's office pedaling really fast to make sure the electricity supply for the uh, uh, for the for the internet's working there. So good for the students. So look, the, there was a common theme that came up several times, and actually several questions um, have arisen around th this whole concept of pain. And to kind of try and pull together the concept, so there's a concept of pain being directly inflammatory response or so-called independent of inflammation, uh, the latter being a, a, a description I, I don't particularly like because it's, it, it's extremely difficult to know what that really is in the world because we, we, we think our outcome measures tell us that there actually isn't inflammation going on at the, the micro tissue level. Hmm, really? Secondly, we heard about where pain came from. And Philip, I, I commend you very much for the, you know, is it central? Is it is it dorsal root ganglion level? Is it at that gating process or at or around the primary sensory neurons? Is it peripheral? Is it is it absolutely in the target tissue uh, where, where there is peripheral sensing? And, and I think probably, Philip, given that you raised the issue, I'm going to give you a first shot at, at both inflammatory, non-inflammatory, your concepts around that. And then where do you think these medicines, either biologic or non-biologic? And Jagtar um, Nijar Singh asked a beautiful question, Q&A. Um, I have to declare the conflict of interest that he he trained me because he he was one of my PhD students in Glasgow. So Jagtar has a lot to be, um, to be uh, responsible for. And I have to say, he made the point that large antibodies are not supposed 
to cross the blood-brain barrier. And, and I'm couching that remark very carefully because do we know what the blood-brain barrier is doing in immune disease patients? So, Phil, do you want to kick off just a few thoughts around mechanism of pain and site of action of MOEs? Sure. So let's think of three, four levels of where uh, pain processing is occurring. One is at the at the very periphery, so in a in a inflamed joint area or an inflamed uh, anthesial area, where there are nerve endings. Uh, with uh, and we call the when there's sensitization of these nerve endings and traffic of various neurotransmitters, we call that peripheral sensitization. And that there are multiple factors that lead to uh, turning on of pain uh, uh, signaling at that point. Then there's uh, th this travels up uh, uh, neurons to the dorsal horn, where uh, there's a sort of relay system that occurs and then it passes into the spinal cord and then up the spinal cord to pain processing centers of the brain where things get really complex because there are all these uh, sort of emotional centers and pain processing centers that are influencing each other uh, up in the brain. So clearly uh, large molecules could have an impact at the peripheral sensitization level and possibly at the dorsal horn without crossing over into, into the uh, central nervous system itself. But we also know that in states of inflammation, the blood-brain barrier can get leaky. Uh, and so there is that potential phenomenon that some of the larger molecules are crossing at that, at that point. The JAK inhibitors, though, are small molecules. And one of the ideas behind their very quick and possibly central uh, level of uh, mediating pain has to do with the fact that they potentially can cross in, uh, across the blood-brain barrier. And interestingly, some of these new nanomolecules that we're seeing in development, like the IL-17A inhibitor, Izocabep, or the, uh, or the Moon Lake product, uh, IL-17A and F inhibitor, uh, these are interesting because they're small molecules and who knows where they're going to be having impact. So I think that at all of these levels, we can see uh, something going on. One last point to make before I turn it over to Janet is that uh, in the tofacitinib studies that we've done in PSA trials, there was a collection of data on itch. It turns out that one of the key correlations with pain mediation in that analysis that was done was through itch. Mm -hmm. And we know that there are special fibers coming uh, that are in the skin where uh, these the itch phenomenon is being transmitted. And so it could well be that some of the, quote, pain reduction that we're seeing is actually through reduction of the whole itch neurologic phenomenon. Fascinating. Um, Janet? You've been called to the fore by Professor Mies, please. Yes, yeah. So first of all, Phil, that was excellent, that explanation. And there's only probably two things I'll add that won't enhance it, but just analogies for the clinicians is itch is also a really big deal in systemic sclerosis. And we know there's mast cells, dendritic cells, histamine granules that are too present there and itch and pain are very related. Anyone that's had chronic itch knows that. So it just gives us an idea to think pain, itch, inflammation, but also thinking almost like allergic cells being present. That's one thing. The other side, just to say is when we do our outcome measures, and Ian, you alluded to it, is that we have to always realize that, you know, there's a disconnect between what a patient feels and thinks and what we think of disease activity, because they're often coming to get pain relief, particularly in their chronic disease states. Acutely, they're coming pain, inflammation, the whole bit. And we have to always realize that I believe fully we can have people in great remission who still have chronic residual pain. And I think that's the plasticity at their brain, but it also shows a more widespread change that they used to have uh, in RA, say their wrist and their second and third MCPs, 
And now you will see sensitization of an entire hand, even areas that weren't involved. So it's even more complicated than the brain plasticity. I think it could be still along the entire pain pathway that you eloquently talked about. So with that, I think I'll stop it there, but that's sort of the clinician's perspective on it. Hi, uh, super helpful. Um, yeah, and, and the problem with outcome measures is they generally get considered in isolation when we really need to think about their interdependency. And you know, if if you uh, and if you make that mistake, then you're in real trouble right at the first base, and you're going to end up with all sorts of strange interpretations of clinical trial data. So always be mildly mildly inquisitive about post hoc analyses as well. Personal view: the the whole pain feels about to explode, and I think it's because of functional brain and functional peripheral nerve imaging. Once we actually can look at what is really happening. We can get away from the this might be happening to the this is what is happening. And do you know what my prediction is? It's going to hugely challenge our understanding of how inflammation and the nervous system actually talk to each other. Hugely exciting field for the future. Um, I want to now uh, move to a, a, a different area, if I may. I'm, I'm doing my best to reflect the, the questions that have come in. There, there's a couple of questions about um, the, the, the gender or sex, to specifically keep this focus, the sex difference in response. Um, Zenifon, you touched on this in, in Axial Spa, but, but heads up to my colleagues, I, I think we all want to chip in here. So differential rate and magnitude of response and also time to onset of response if we put all of the presentations together. Any thoughts on why that might be the case, Zenifon? Well, there's many different um, reasons to think about how, why this might be happening. Um, my experience, and this is again a single person's experience, I don't know what the others think about that, is that indeed um, it seems to be that, as I mentioned in my in my short presentation, it seems to be that for many different reasons, females feel the pain, describe the pain, um, in fact, um, uh, also cross the PROs on pain differently than males. There is actually very good data for the axial part of the body um, from the Netherlands, uh, we published a couple of years ago, where they tried, they asked the females and males to describe where exactly they have their pain and how intense that is, and there was, uh, there were indeed uh, significant differences there. Um, just a very short example, for example, it is that females feel the pain in the axial spondylarthritis feel more in the upper part of the body, as compared to the males who feel it in the lower part of the body. Um, this, I mean, just in, you know, imagine now what's happening, what might be maybe happening. You have a young female person who has constantly chronic in her young ages, uh, chronic back pain in the upper part, in the neck, and so on. But you don't really see anything in the sacroiliac joints where everything everybody thinks this is spondyloarthritis. What's your next most probable diagnosis? It's most probably fibromyalgia. Yeah. So we miss these patients, and this is just because the disease seems to be happening differently in the different areas, but also because patients describe males and females describe the pain differently. And the very last comment is that, by the way, we published a couple of years ago that also the radiographic damage in females happens more in the spine, in the cervical spine, whereas significantly lower things happen in the cervical spine in males, and this is exactly the opposite in, female, in males. They have it in the lower, lower, uh, lumbar spine. So my answer to this very shortly is different perception of pain. Interesting. Um, Janet? So, I mean, in RA, um, it is different or it isn't. So I'm being very on the fence because there's data that suggests that because women in general start at higher pain levels, but they also start at higher disease activity, the delta of response between women and men is highly similar. But if you start at a higher DAS and a higher pain and you have the same delta, you end at a, a higher than, you know, you, do, you start at the elevator of 11 floor, go to seven. The other people start at nine and go to five. The delta is the same. However, there's a lot of interaction. Some of it could be social conditioning. Some of it is really ethnic variation. And then that would be men and women, not just women solely. And I think some of it is probably truly drug distribution. And we know estrogen receptors are kind of important for inflammation. And I think they are kind of 
ignored a lot. Like I don't do that kind of basic science, but I think there's more to it. And I think the role of vitamin D affecting those receptors as well might be important, but I still haven't given you an answer. So I think it's actually more discrepancies in the seronegative um, types of inflammatory arthritis than in the rheumatoid arthritis patients. But I think more needs to be learned. Yeah, fascinating. Philip, um, if you'd like to maybe comment briefly, and then I have a follow-up that I specifically want to send in your direction about outcome measures, but just any, any additional remarks? There one additional remark, even, even though I'm very much of a curious student about the whole phenomenon of fibromyalgias, I think that there is an important area of immunobiology that should be mentioned. Uh, a number Several years ago, uh, Rob Inman's group from Toronto uh, studied uh, a group of about 17 female and 17 male ankylosing spondylitis patients, radiographic uh, axial spa, and found differences in uh, gene expression in the IL-17 pathway. Uh, and I think that we're going to find that there are uh, important differences. And one of the studies coming forward from the GRAPA group is a large study that another Canadian, uh, Leahy Etter, is leading uh, Janet Pope, Rob Inman, uh, uh, Leahy Hunter. God, what a power. And a half, isn't it? The, uh, the, is, uh, she, we're doing a study where we're going to collect patient, 400 patients, male, female, and try to really uh, characterize what are the neurohormonal, oh. immunobiologic, and pain processing uh, differences uh, in PSA patients. Thanks, Philip. I'm just as a follow on, there's a, a very interesting question is fr from one of our, our delegates, and thank you for that. It, is it time to start to think about how we use outcome measures for males and females differently in trials? I mean, do we need to start? Is that where we have to go here? Is that the next step? I'm going to jump in with one quick comment there. So one of the things that I've been advocating uh, more recently in, in trial design for phase two, use a, a sophisticated questionnaire that helps distinguish amount of fibromyalgia and central sensitization in the population. And if you, even though you don't, may have a patient uh, that's, that's otherwise eligible for the study, doesn't have a clear cut history of fibro, but scores high on one of these questionnaires, consider excluding them. Because what you're really trying to get at in phase two is, do we have a drug here? Is there true biology that we want to learn about? Uh, let's exclude these patients. But in phase three, do it completely differently. Do the same questionnaires, but keep everybody in. And then use it as a, a way of analyzing the data post hoc uh, as an important contextual factor and see how much influence the degree of fibromyalgia has contributed to differences in responses, because that's going to be a more real world type of situation. But in terms of doing a study on only males or only females, um, I, I don't think I'm for that as much. We're not quite there yet. Just um, a, a couple of thoughts around that before that there's one final theme I'd like to bring out before we close. Um, yeah, that, that's, that, that, that is utterly fascinating. So I, I'm not a huge believer in um, body-mind dualism. I, I really, ha as, as a, I guess I'm a clinician, but I have somewhere in my life a molecular immunology background. It really does seem difficult to rationalize all of the data that are now becoming quite consistent without postulating some kind of biology here. And the immunoendocrine interactions, each receptor uh, engagement has been looked at as an anti-inflammatory mechanism on its own right, as Janet well knows, hence her remark. And I think as we start to understand the, the, the neuroendocrine immuno interactions, you know, we've touched on this with pain. It's entirely conceivable that there will be real biology in here. However, even I, as a sort of, uh, as a cynic around the, the dualism arguments, one has to recognize social conditioning and expectations and all that Janet has laid out for us. So I think this is a huge area for investigation in times to come because if it's, if it's operating in the context of a clinical trial, it's probably also alter, operating in clinical practice. But because of the noise there, it's going to be far harder to work that out. And that's when, of course, we start to worry about unconscious biases as clinicians. Are we missing 
things that really matter. And, you know, are we more likely to miss that in our female patients? And that would be unacceptable to us, of course. Just um, I, I, as we kind of move to close, I, I want to just touch, we did actually hear quite a lot about um, JAK inhibitors. Um, there's a, a, a couple of questions I'd like to deal with very quickly. Um, one is um, broadening the the use of JAK inhibitors. Um, the, the, the wonderful um, Dr. Stone has put a question in asking about whether baricitinib, and for that, I'm going to generalize this in the interest of CME, uh, JAK inhibition in a rheumatoid patient previously TNF inhibited, uh, that brought the disease under control, uh, then went over to uh, rituximab for three years because of uh, anterior posterior scleritis and now is rheumatoids under control and so is the scleritis but could one move over to JAK inhibitor because there's really troublesome neuropathic pain so I guess the question Janet um, it's a relatively quick one any any thoughts on um, scleritis stability in the context of JAK inhibition? Right. So, I mean, the bottom line on that and an the answer to the question is who knows what to do, but you could add um, an anti-neuropathic kind of agent like a pregabalin gabapentin because why rock the boat when the eyes are good? Um, scleritis, episcleritis, the full scleritis corneal melt uh, pathway is could be devastating in patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis causing local damage and severe pain as well. So it's it's important that we don't mess with things uh, from the scleritis perspective. On the other hand, there are data, I have reviewed the literature recently of anecdotal reports of various JAK inhibitors, including the ones we have in practice that can actually help um, uh, scleritis, episcleritis, some data on uveitis, but they would not never be our number one treatments in that area. So in other words, I don't have an answer, but it's interesting. That's a great answer. It, you know, if something is interesting, so there's an unmet need here for us to understand better. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, Millicent, if that gets you quite where you need to be, but I think it does give you confidence that the decision you make is sensible because there is no huge literature out there that would dissuade you otherwise, and that's always reassuring, actually, particularly if a, if a patient is uh, has a medical background. Um, as ever in life, it's about explanation, isn't it? Um, I'm going to cheat and take one more minute, and, and it's actually because um, Xenophon and, and Philip, you both alluded to this as you went through, you know, the ASAS recommendations, starting to think about, um, you know, the presence of psoriasis go down one route, the presence of um, of ocular inflammation go down another route. It, um, one of our delegates has asked the question about personalized medicine in psoriatic arthritis and AXPA. Now, we don't have time to go down the whole route, and I'm going to kind of abbreviate this by saying we do not have biomarkers that allow us to personalize treatment decisions. But I think we do have clinical phenotypes now that are taking us down a certain route, and you've both touched on that. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds each, the elevator pitch. Xenophon, what would guide you in one MOA over another in a patient with AXPA? Yes, I think in 30 seconds, that's relatively easy. Please check the update of the Azazul recommendations. We clearly state, as I mentioned, um, concomitant psoriasis, rather use Al-17 inhibitors, uh, active IBD or current uveitis uh, or active uveitis, use a monoclonal antibody against DNF, otherwise use everything you've had. But the question was also, Ian, about males and females. I can tell you we need a couple of years to find that out, but we will find out, not me, but we all the field is working on that extremely intensively. Thank you, Zanfon. And Philip, personalizing or at least stratifying MOE choices in our patients in PSA? It, it's pretty straightforward at the moment uh, in the absence of biomarkers. Patients with heavy degrees of skin disease, I'd probably uh, aim for a IL-17 or IL-23 inhibitor uh, first. Uh, over a TNF inhibitor and JAK inhibitor simply because you get slightly better uh, clearance of the skin likelihood. Uh, in a patient with spine involvement, uh, I would probably go with the, what we have good evidence for currently, which are the IL-17 TNF inhibitors and JAK inhibitors. We're learning about the IL-23 inhibitors through the STAR trial, but we need to see that data before uh, elevating that to um, a primo position. And then for both uveitis and IBD uh, associations, I would uh, favor a monoclonal TNF antibody construct 
uh, most likely for those. And then as we're learning more and more about Jack and IL-23 inhibition in uh, inflammatory bowel disease and those two types of classes of medications when there is IBD present. Thanks. Um, I always feel hugely reassured when I'm able to say I agree completely with Philip, which usually means that I'm for once likely to be correct. But um, look, here's the deal, folks. We have run out of time. And it is an absolute pleasure, therefore, for me to um, uh, make a few very short uh, summative remarks. My, my first is to thank our amazing faculty. They've, they've cherry-picked the literature and e each could have spent a full hour surveying their respective disciplines. 22 was an amazing year. When you think about that 22's products came during a, a pandemic. You know, they were the reports that came for stuff we did. I think as a discipline, we should be so proud of ourselves with what we continue to do for our patients during the pandemic and will continue to do post-pandemic. So thanks to our faculty for such clarity of description and for such uh, clarity of thought as you brought those ideas to the fore. Thank you very much to, to the CSF team for keeping the lights on for guiding us through here. It's always amazing when that happens. Um, and, and as part of that, for our CSF colleagues, please do give us some feedback. Be nice, be unkind, whatever you want, but um, most importantly, just tell us what worked for you, what didn't, because we will be doing this again and we want to do it as well as we possibly can. Um, you can look at this again if you feel so inclined through the YouTube channel, Cytokine Signaling Forum. My children don't allow me to look at YouTube. I don't get a, a, a look in at home, but for those of you who have better controlled family members, please do go to, um, to the Cytokine Signaling Forum and, uh, and take advantage of a quick reprise you will not be disappointed. And finally, of course, my really sincere thanks to all of you. You've taken time out of your busy schedules. You've come to, 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 to spend time with us. We've enjoyed your company. Thank you for the questions. They were spot on. Apologies that there were one or two questions that we did not get to. I've tried to answer them offline. Um, and, and, you know, the ones that still have questions unanswered, well, that's what the next webinar is going to be all about because we'll have read them and we'll be bringing the answers to you at a webinar coming sometime soon. So please do go to the CSF website. It's an incredible resource. There's slides there. There's abstracts there. The slides are yours to use. They'll help you when you are delivering your own education to your colleagues, to your friends, to your fellows. And with that, I'm going to wish you a very successful and more importantly, a peaceful and healthy 2023. Thank you for being with us and uh, the very best of times ahead. Let's close the webinar with those remarks. Thank you.